little test here. Hey! Hey guys and gals, we're going to be starting in about uh, 25 minutes. Thank you for uh, uh, logging in. We'll be there in a little bit. Can't wait to talk to you.
Now, your last You're going to need to read the bottom of the uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Hey, guys and gals. Welcome. This is our inaugural, inaugural? Yeah. yeah inaugural, inaugural episode of, uh, uh, what are we calling it? <laughs> Exploring Perspectives. Exploring Perspectives. Um, basically, the point of what we're trying to do is we're going to get away a little bit from, uh, for a separate show, going to get away a little bit from the straight question and answer where you guys ask us questions and we answer them. And we're going to just start exploring different topics that there won't necessarily be answers to and not really necessarily kilt related, but culture related and different kind of things. Um, so we're going to bring up some points. Eric and I are going to kind of unpack them a little bit and you guys feel free to load some questions or load some thoughts into the comment area. We have Mac over on the, uh, or the live stream over there on the computer. Yep. So, We'll stop at specific intervals and kind of see if there's anyone feeding in questions and that kind of thing. So, sounds good. With that said, dun, dun, dun. you want to go over the topic for today, Mr. Eric? Uh, I had it all written down, so now it's completely left my brain. Yes. Um, we've been thinking about this a lot, and we tend to think about it a lot just off and on on a daily basis because we're in the kilt business. Uh, and it's in a nutshell, Scottish and writ large Celtic culture and symbols, icons, patterns, motifs, all that stuff tends to get used in a lot of marketing, a lot of branding and in the media a lot and in pop culture a lot. And the question is how often is that respectful to the root culture and how often is it disrespectful and how would you define either of those ends of the spectrum? You know, where, where does it lie and uh, when can you decide if thing something is is appropriate or not, is that is that yeah, and not a bad start, I guess. Yeah, and ultimately, where do you land on the issue? Mm -hmm. um, as I said, you know, Eric and I will kind of unpack questions and give some opinions, some thoughts, kind of look at both sides of an argument, and then really, it's we're not trying to define it. It's more up to you to decide right. where do you fit in this kind of thing. Yeah, we're not here to pass judgment on any yeah. of this stuff, but it's definitely. If you follow our Facebook group, you'll see occasionally this topic does come up. Um, anywhere in the media where people who are into Celtic culture gather in social media, it's it comes up a lot. You know, like somebody posts a picture of something from like a movie clip or an advertisement or or a joke or something. And it's just like some people love it, some people hate it, some people are in the middle. So yeah, where's the line? Yeah. So we'll start off with tartans. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of companies actually have their own registered tartans mm -hmm. and either use them in their own advertising, they'll use them in their own products, um, or they may just use a generic tartan. Some register it, some don't. Um, mm -hmm. Some examples. Burberry has their own tartan. Burberry. Burberry. Um, yeah, that's... How famous is that? Do it's people? pretty pretty darn famous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd say a lot of, especially in the UK, um, it is a you know a clothing brand, or it basically they started off making trench coats, I believe, in World War One. Yes. Um, and they designed their own tartan. It was just really a check, but they actually had it registered and copyrighted okay. and stuff. Okay. Um, Brooks Brothers has their own tartan. Uh, they teamed up with, I believe, it was Kinlock Anderson, which is a well-known Scottish brand. Um. And they register their own tartan. They use it in several of their products. Um, recently, I think they did it like five years ago, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, uh, brands like Hello Kitty, they have their own tartan. <laughs> so even like a Japanese cartoon brand has its own tartan. Mm -hmm. um, American Express has a tartan. The the Scottish Soda Iron Brew, you know, has their own tartan, and it is as orange as you would think it would be. And blue. And yes, yeah. orange and blue and white, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, so. How do we feel about companies having their own tartan? Is it wrong for companies to use tartan in the marketing? How do you feel about that? It, I think that uh, the devil is in the details. Um, and I think this is a theme that we'll probably come back to again and again. It's a question of whether they're using it as a, a sincere aesthetic expression of the company or whether they're using it as kind of a, just a fast pastiche kind of um, cashing in on the cachet. Right. so to speak, you know, it's, it's, and, and for every company, it's going to be a little bit different because tartan in and of itself as an art form is really cool. You know, for thousands of years, people have been creating tartans just for the pleasure of looking at tartan. Um, now when it gets into that, a tartan, which is a clan tartan or a very famous tartan that has a lot of history behind it. Um, then there's some other consequences or ramifications if you're using it, I would think. Yeah. The, um, 
Uh, basically, it's about how respectful you are um, and are you a sincere student of Scottish and Celtic culture and of the art form of tartans, if you want to qualify it as an art form. Mm -hmm. um, are you being a respectful student of it or are you just using it as part of shtick? Um, are you being, you know, crass about it? Where, you know, where on the line do certain companies fall with how they use certain things? I'll make, I'll make two, two ends of the spectrum kind of statements. One would be, one extreme thought would be that tartans should only be used to express the clan that the tartan was made for. That if it's a clan tartan that has a clear identify identity as a symbol of a certain group, then it shouldn't be used for anything else. <clears throat> that, let's call that like an ultra traditionalist kind of a view. Okay. okay? okay. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I'd say that tartan is one of several exports of the culture of Scotland. Yes. And it's kind of its gift to the world. And in that sense, <laughs> once people, once people have it, what they do with it at that point is kind of up to them. Beyond the control. Yeah. I, or, I've used actually that yeah. line. I'm laughing because I use that line. Mm -hmm. Tartan is Scotland's gift, gift to, the, to the, world. the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, as in one of our speeches at the St. Andrews mm -hmm. thing down in the, uh, yeah. in Philly. But, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like I was saying, Tartan has been around since like the bronze age in, in various place, parts of the world. But Scotland is the place where it really took on its own uh, real power, came into its own yeah. as an art form. As, as a meaningful thing. Yeah. 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 Before it was just pretty, then in Scotland, they kind of attached meaning to it and mm -hmm. ascribed meaning to it and, you know, continued yeah. on. Um, then this kind of begs the question, is the fact that anyone, you, you, me, him, him, anybody can register their own tartan with the Scottish tartan registry, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does that uh, just allow it to continue and allow a tradition to evolve and to move forward and change with the times? Hmm. Or is it disrespectful and does it cheapen it by being able to do that? There's you know, a, is, uh, it, is it too easy? Is Yeah. Is it too easy? I mean, okay. basically anybody with 140 bucks and a computer can register a tartan. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll use one example of, you know, there's obviously the Scottish clan tartans are registered and that's kind of how it started yeah. um, in, I want to say 2007 or 2008, somewhere around there. Um, the Scottish tartan society and the Scottish tartan world registry kind of both went to the Scottish government and helped them form the tar the Scottish register of tartans, mm -hmm. which is an official governing body. Now in Scotland, it's actually part of the register or part of the, the government and they just record tartans. That's their job is just to record them, not to pass judgment, not to say this is good or bad, but to just record. Yeah. So while you can have a brand doing something or like uh, tartans for good causes like world peace tartan or, you know, charitable causes can have their own tartan. Yeah. You can also have, individual people registering their own tartan all the way down to people just registering it for, you know, uh, the moon rise tartan, which is just okay. to celebrate, you know, the landing on the moon and seeing right, the earth right. rise, earth rise, tartan, right. whatever it was right. called. Right. Um, people doing it for their, their tea brand and they put different tartans on different tins of tea mm -hmm. or the, the extreme example, um, which raised a few hackles when it happened. Um, there's a tartan called the BJ tartan, B-E-E-J-A-Y, um, which a, a gent, I don't know where he is located, but he registered a tartan for his, to commemorate the life of his dead dog. Now, not passing judgment on, you know, animal lovers or on dogs, but is that worthy, worthy of a tartan? That's a question that we're kind of, you know, part of this whole discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, the, the background that you mentioned, I find interesting also is that, um, we're talking about something which is very definitely has been maybe even more of a slippery slope in the past than it is now, because now you have a highly recognizable central authority which tries to keep track of this stuff. And that's actually very recent. I mean, you've had you've had various noted scholars yeah. who have put out compendiums and, and analyses of Tartan and the history of Tartan. Um, and, but you've had the but the efforts to catalog it all has either been a private operation done <clears throat> by the mills or it's been a, a labor of love by individuals like the groups that you mentioned yeah. it started off so. with the uh scottish tartan society i'm not sure when they started but i know they, they're pretty i think they're pretty old yeah, it, yeah. reason like 1950s maybe mm -hmm. if i had to guess don't quote me on it um and then when they kind of disband the uh one of them was uh keith lumsden formed a scottish tartan world registry and then brian wilton got with the assistance of a bunch of different mills in the UK, um, started the Scottish Tartans Authority. And they were kind of two groups that were separate 
both keeping track of the records. Mm -hmm. um, and then they kind of came back together um, to help the government set up the official register in the you know mid 2000s. You see that that begs part of the question too is that the reason you form an organization or an effort to do something a lot of the time is because you you have a concern about the topic like you're worried about it. Yeah. So did they do it out of a sense of if we don't do this this is going to be lost or we're going to descend into some sort of chaos or or was it really just a, a matter of we want to document our pride? Because because you know you could take it either way and the fact that now you have the the authority there um is it a guarding? It doesn't function as a guardsman of traditional <clears throat> culture so much as a, it, a tool of traditional culture. So yes, um, it it's yes, I agree one hundred percent on the tool. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit of a guarding because it's effectively a copyright. It's a timestamp. You're sure, saying that sure. this is for not for spe specifically clan tartans that are you know a couple hundred years old, mm -hmm. but for like American Heritage or Firefighters Memorial ones that we designed. Yeah. Um, we are saying at this point in time, this is the tartan, this is the person who registered it, and it's uh, it's protection under the law, at least in the UK and in the US, we copyright stuff. Um, right. But that's uh, that'll kind of bring us into our next thing of the the bastardization or the the people specifically pushing against it. Mm -hmm. um, another question I want to unpack a little bit is like the the origins of punk rock in the seventies using okay. tartans. Okay. Um, they specifically used you know, Royal Stewart, Royal Stewart. Yeah. as, you know, a, a flip off to the queen, you know, yeah. at that point, the, you know, the people that were wearing tartan were, you know, posh, they were upper crusty. Um, and the punk rock kids in the UK or in England, really in yeah. the late seven, mid seventies, late seventies, yeah, mid, mid to late. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they said that, okay, we are going to take what is yours and it's now ours. We are going to destroy it. We're going to take your symbol of hierarchy and whatever, and we're going to put safety pins through it and rip it and put zippers Basically all over co it. Co-opt it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's yeah, yeah. Good word. Yeah. And that was a uh, Vivian Westwood was the one who really yes. got that whole trend yeah. started. I mean, as a designer, I think it was probably a folk thing that was happening and she just decided, aha, I can take that to the next level as an art thing. But, but again, then, yeah, see, and then you're not even talking about Scotland. You're talking about the British government. Wait, it was a Scottish thing. Then it was a royal thing. This royal Stuart is like the with the Victorians and everybody cashing in on the idea of oh, well, we should have a tartan too. You know, even though we're not Scottish, and then you know, drawing it in. I mean, well, Stuart is Scottish, but you yeah. know what I mean. The royal yeah, yeah. family of yeah. Great Britain. You know, and then and then it get getting turned on its head. But that's all happening outside of Scotland initially. I mean, that was like London yeah. with the punk yeah. scene. You yeah. know, so um, yeah, it gets pretty complicated pretty quick. Now, is that? Um, and how do you categorize that? Is that an artistic expression of a, you know, disenfranchised youth just trying to attach to a symbol and which adds to the value and the culture of the symbol, mm -hmm. or is that degrading the symbol at the time? I'm sure that, you know, if you had a Royal Stewart kilt and you were upper crusty, you would feel that it's degrading and you would feel that it's disrespectful and you yeah. would feel that it's horrible. And through the lens of time, now we're looking at it, you know, 30, 40 years later saying, okay, that was just an artistic movement mm -hmm. towards, you know, rebellion and yeah, towards you could, you you know, that. that kind of thing. It's, it, I think it's, it has also become part of the British identity. I mean, now it's like you Royal Stewart on punk clothing is part of, it just says London to people or it says like yeah. urban England to people, yeah. you know, and you can go and get your picture taken with a postcard punk in Hyde Park, you know, so it's become, it's been brought back into the fold as an identity thing. Yeah. It's not an identity thing that anybody back in the 18th or 19th century would have ever possibly predicted, <laughs> you know, no freaking way, but, uh, but it, it has happened. So it's kind of like the, you know, once the tartan is out of the tartan box, can you ever put, yeah, you it, back put in? it back in? Yeah. yeah. So do we have any questions yet? I'm curious. There's been a lot of, a lot of talk back and forth here. Okay. Um, there seems to be everyone seems to be for the most part on board with a with a company having having a tartan, okay. um, but some of the thought process is that it for a company to have a have a tartan have it registered, and it kind of being locked down to what's the no one else can have it. It's just the just the company. It's mm -hmm. so well. What I would say, speaking from the from the aspect of a company who does own several tartans and who has several of them uh, copyrighted and controlled, the point to doing it is control. If you're going to take time and effort to design your own tartan, to market it, to use it as part of your branding and incorporate it into the core, you know, ness, the core being of what your company is, 
you don't want it co-opted. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, going back to the punk thing, if yeah. that's going to teach anyone a lesson, it's going to be corporations being able to say, I don't want someone else to be able to weave this. I don't want someone to be able to take my tartan for a, for my brand using my voice and then do something else with it. Uh -huh. So I, I get why they would want to control it. Um, I also understand their perspective of saying, well, what's the point then, you know, it's not widespread, but the other side of the coin would be, does it need to be widespread? Would, would you prefer as the designer and reverse the roles? If you were the designer, would you want, uh, if you're, uh, would you want someone using your tartan in a way that you wouldn't see fit? Um, I don't want to get into a, a political, you know, yeah, but angle, but would you want the, the, the Democrat Republican to be used or tartan to be used by Republicans or, you know, like as that kind of extreme differences, mm -hmm. you really have to be careful, um, how your creation is used because that can ultimately change the meaning of what it is as a symbol to people. Would that be a fair? I think that's valid. That's that. That's going to that. That's kind of a internal uh, question that anybody who's an artist or the creator or the controller is going to have to answer. Yeah. Um, I think like if I were the um, the creator of like uh, one of the breast cancer awareness tartans or something like that, I would be happy to see that all over the place because I was hoping they would basically virally spread my message. Now, if I am using it as a tartan for my um, my very specific, very tight knit social club or something like that. You know, like, like, you know, we are, we are all members of this club and we are from the Albuquerque area and this is the Albuquerque, you know, Mastodon brotherhood tartan. You might get annoyed if somebody is using it who is not a brother Mastodon, yeah. you know? And I, just to go back to the, the breast cancer one, it, what would happen or how would you feel if you designed a tartan for a charity for a breast cancer charity? And then somebody else said, hmm, I really like that tartan. Mm. I'm not going to pay you right, right. You're not to collecting. use it. Yeah. I'm not going to give any money to the charity, but I'm going to make money off of it and sell things in it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mac. Yeah, I was, on those lines, I was thinking of kind of like going back to the 40s with the McDuck tartan, which Disney owns. And that was used oh, yeah, yeah, that was yeah, used for to buy for war bonds. But so McDuck, right? Yeah. 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 yeah okay, OK. So they're using that to <clears throat> in their marketing of some sort mm -hmm. to use to help buy war bonds. So it's similar to what you're saying there with the uh, right. with like a breast cancer one. Cool. All right. Now, now we're going to start exploring a little bit um, with. Uh, specifically American businesses who use tartan in their marketing and, you know, kind of what goes into that. Um, a couple different examples. Um, one, I know there is a kilted real realtor, uh, a gent who actually, as part of his daily wear, wears a kilt as a realtor. Um, I think it's brilliant. Frankly, the, uh, sorry, I'm not, this is a little bit of opinion. So yeah, we're allowed. You're talking about um, the business side of it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I've actually told um, a, a, a couple of friends of ours or customers of ours who are car salesmen. I have said, look, if you wear a kilt while you are selling cars, you are going to do one of two things. 95% of the time, you'll, or 5%, you may annoy somebody who goes, oh, geez, a guy in a skirt, I'm not going to talk to him. But 95% of the time, people are going to be disarmed and want to come up and talk to you. They're not going to be pensive and like, oh, uh, salesman, they're going to see something and want to talk to you. And as a salesman, just opening up dialogue mm -hmm. is the beginning of any sale sure. and making the customer feel at ease. Um, so if you, as a salesman or as a representative of a company, have a kilt on, in my mind, in my humble opinion, or not so humble as it were, the, um, uh, it is a great marketing standpoint to just kind of keep people at ease with you and make them want to kind of talk to you and come up and just kind of, you know, have a chat. And that's half the battle of, you know, discussing business with them. Would you make that recommendation to someone who has no Celtic affiliation at all? Because I could see how it could work or not work. If they are, uh, back to our other point, I'd say yes, if they are an honest student of this. Okay. If they're just using it for shtick, um, let's say the the uh, the window cleaning company that wears the oh, the men in, the, men the men in kilts, kilts cleaning uh, windows, window cleaning they have the yeah, no yeah. peaking shirts. They're not all Scottish. They're yeah. <laughs> they're not all you know typical Scottish looking, shall we say? Mm -hmm. um, 
and they have it on. Now, again, it's great for marketing. People will yep. will remember it based on that. Yep. Um, is it honorable? Does it well prove that you are a true student of the culture to just to, slap on a kill? Be, yeah, to be to be a little bit opinionated about it for a moment because I, I don't I want to try and stay as neutral as possible so people can discuss it themselves. But um, I would say that if you are wearing a kilt because it is a personal expression, whether you're Celtic or not, in you know from a tartan standpoint, maybe preferable that you're actually Celtic. Um, but you're wearing the kilt as a personal expression, then it works as an icebreaker, is what I would say. Yeah, you know, going back to the realtor because it's yeah. all about a, a per interpersonal relationship. Yes. Whereas your other example would be uh, the kilted window cleaners guys. They're not having a, a personal interaction really with a customer. They're basically the team who comes out and actually does the work, and they'll they'll say hi to the homeowner or the business owner. Yeah. Um, but the kilts are there in that case. I think purely for the titillation factor. They're just cashing in on yeah. the joke. Yeah, that's why it's the no peeking on no the no peeking, right? Yeah. And and that's where um, I've probably expressed this to you before, but I think that when we talk about all this stuff, there's a there's kind of a a number of factors at work. And it's basically, there's there's the history factor, the culture factor, the nostalgia factor, and the pride factor. But then there's also the um, the sex appeal of the kilt itself or of, <laughs> okay. Um, well, we got the bald thing going. So we got, we got double whammy going, but um, um, bald and kilted. And uh, and I lost my train of thought. Um, no, it's-, it's Humor. The, well, yeah, I was going to yeah. say that, but but the sex appeal slash uh, of the of the of the kilt itself, but also the the uh, the gravitas and the power and the virility of the classic Highlander of the Scotsman, you yeah. know, and and then then you've got the humor and the cliches, and you have opposite the history side, you've also got a kind of a fantasy side, you know, you've got yeah. Mel Gibson as the Braveheart, William Wallace versus. Liam Neeson as a maybe not completely historically accurate, but very accurate compared to Mel Gibson, Rob Roy, you know, and, yeah. and there's always these are, these are constantly getting mixed up. Um, this, this makes me want to talk about how it happens in Scotland, but I don't know if you want, let's, you know, finish up talking about the American sure. guys first. The, <clears throat> the one other, um, uh, two other ones I'll bring up real quick. Um, one in relates to Tartan as well. I just thought of this, um, the tilted kilt. Is actually yeah. a uh, a company that's like the, the Scottish Hooters, if you will, yeah. um, where it's just you know sexy women in short mini kilts. Yeah. Um, they actually designed designed, and I'm using that finger quotes, um, and I'm shocked that it got passed. Um, mm -hmm. Their own tartan. They wear a royal Stuart. I always thought it was just royal Stuart. No, they flipped the yellow and the white stripe, and then they copyrighted it. And I think okay. I think that is freaking ridiculous. Okay, that they were. And frankly, I'm surprised that the Tartan Registry and the STA allowed that to get around, and they called that enough of a change to let them register it, much that's, less copyright that's it. Super subtle. Yes, that's it is. Very it's very, change. very subtle. I know it's um, in heraldic terms. A lot of time, um, you're, and again, my perspective is from the the SCA, so we're kind of a special heraldic group. But we always say you have to have at least three points of difference. You know, between your device and anybody else's in order to register it. Right. So the fact they only had one point of difference. Yep. Now I think there's some historical precedent for that. There is, but that minor of a change and then to be copyrightable, mm -hmm. to me, uh, they have great attorneys. That's and, <laughs> that's well, all I'm going to say. Know, but it's it, but you can grudgingly respect it too from a business standpoint because they the fact <clears throat> that that tartan is so close to Royal Stewart, it helps them to have people out there who will immediately associate anytime they see Royal Stewart with their tilted kilt experience or with the idea of going to tilted kilt. I was like, Oh yeah, that just, that reminds me of those waitresses. So psychologically. That's why they're doing it. Psycho From a psychological standpoint, I think that's why they're doing it. No, I think they actually just had it woven and then it was a little bit of a screw up and then they just ended up. <laughs> okay. Okay. It. Fine. The, um, I think psychologically, if that is their play, then I get it and I can respect it being a student of psychology marginally yeah. from a business owner and tartan creator aspect. I think they're bums. I think mm -hmm. they're literally okay. taking something. And this is no opinion at all, by the way, <laughs> I think we've, gone off, neutral, we've already gone off the rails neutral, on yeah. this. Um, I think they're bums. They've literally taken something that is already famous and then co-opted it for their own thing instead of doing what I would consider the honorable thing and just saying, okay, I'm going to design my own from scratch. Very on tartan. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
moving past that. But again, but again, they are using the sex appeal aspect of it. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Only. That's basically that's basically the the one of those factors I was talking yeah. about that they're using. And a little bit of just the general Scottishness. Yeah. You know, I bet there's some Scottish things no. on the menu there, maybe. <clears throat> no. No, not no. even. No, I think I was not there even. once. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the other one that would fall in the American category. I, I've been getting served Facebook ads for Bones Coffee Highland Grog, mm. Highland Grog, mm -hmm. um, and basically they're kind of you know leaning into the Scottish thing. And the description of the coffee is a toffee, a toffee flavored coffee that has that's infused with spiced rum. Now, while that doesn't necessarily sound displeasing, sounds, sounds good. What the hell does that have to do with Scotland? <laughs> like nothing. It literally they have a little. Watch your language. Me. Oh, sorry, mom. <laughs> um, they have a little skeleton dude with a kilt on, mm -hmm. but it has literally. If it was whiskey infused coffee flavor, yeah. I would yeah. get it. Yeah. Or if it was, you know, uh, lavender or something that was, you know, Scottish right. Right. or shortbread infused. Toffee, toffee fine. is a toffee is an English thing. Yeah, I've, or at least I've always been under the impression it's very it's associated with England, yeah, but, England not Scotland. But in that aspect, Maybe. they're not. It's it literally has nothing to do with the culture. And I'm trying to <laughs> reel in my opinion again, which isn't good for easy for me to mm -hmm. do. Um, what does that have to do with Celtic culture? Why are they using it? Are there is that an honorable use of? Scottishness is that just a marketing thing? Is that okay, or does it feel slimy? It seems like it's just a pastiche on the surface. It seems like they're just using it because they know it'll get attention and they could draw a cool logo. Now, for Agreed. all we we're know, talking about it. For all we know, <laughs> the owner of the company desperately wanted to get something Scottish onto his labels because he's proud of his heritage. But he didn't. He's like, "Well, we got a new flavor, boss. You want to put something Scottish on that? Sure. You know, as long as it's Scottish, it's cool with me." But, yeah, but it then, could be it could be a personal expression that we're not aware of, maybe. Agree. I'm trying to cut them some slack, but you uh, know it's I I would cut them that same slack, but then the question is, are they just paying lip service to it? If all mm -hmm. they're doing is literally using an icon, then it has nothing to do with the culture outside of the icon on the outside of the of the grounds. Yeah. 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 There's a beer like that too, right? There's a beer. Oh, there's there's Scotch ales Scotch, out the yeah. wazoo. No, but there wasn't a Scotch ale. It was a specific there was a beer which was um, I'll think of it later. Well, a lot of uh, Scotch ales are do use Scottish iconography or tartan or whatever on the label, okay. specifically okay. because they are a Scotch ale. Right. Um, right. I've, I think a logical, I know what you're logical tie. -in yes, in there. but if it's like yeah. an IPA, um, would it necessarily be a Scot unless it's a Scottish company? Yeah. Um, I think Max got something from the got audience. Some, yeah. Going back to what you kind of started with, with the um, I believe it was the window cleaning. Uh, company. Um, Baron is on here saying that he attends a trade festival, okay. uh, international trade festival, and he wears his kilt along with his other regalia. Cool. And he is recognized um, out of the thousands and thousands of so people it's, it's there. Yeah. So right, it yeah. remember yeah. they, they remind Absolutely. they are you know he's remembered every time he's there. He's also it helps it's helped his business just because of wearing that. Uh -huh. Yes. He stands out from the crowd. Absolutely. And now here's my question for Baron. Um, how often when you talk to people at the trade show or do they wind up asking you about your heritage or why you wear the kilt? Because I think the strength of using it as a mechanism like that would be the backstory you can give once you yes. break the ice. It's the step in the, it's the step in the door. Yeah. It could go either way. It could be like, I'm very proud of my Scottish heritage, or it could be, well, I'm a free spirit and I, and I love kilts and I love the comfort and the freedom and the style. Either one would work. Um, I would expect that the, the heritage aspect would probably work better, but that also might depend on where you're at and what you're selling. He yeah. said not very often. Really? Okay. Hmm. So the people don't usually ask. They just, it's like, where's that kilt guy? We got to find him because we got to talk about that thing. Okay. Nice. Cool. No, there's uh quickly touching on it. There was another company about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mac will probably remember um, the Highland Water Company. They were out in Colorado. Hmm. Um, they came to us and the name was Highland Water Company. And that had been the name of the company and the guy that bought it literally said, I want to put all my sales guys and all, all my delivery guys in kilts. So their their tagline was men in kilts delivering water. Um, and he straight was, he I believe he was Scottish or of Scottish descent, um, but he was just strictly using it as a marketing thing. And the same kind of thing there, same kind of thing as like the kilted realer, uh, kilted realtor, to use it as a, a, a memory device to make it you memorable to the customers when you're speaking to someone, make them go, oh yeah, that company, the guy in the kilt, that's right. Um, and just 
make your company memorable. It's an, mm -hmm. a, an easy way to make it memorable in a crowded marketplace for and something. That's, that's also why companies register company tartans though. Yeah, true. You know, I think, I think basically, I mean, Hello Kitty, I think they did it purely as an artistic expression because tartan is very popular. Tartan has actually been popular in Japan since the 16th century. Yeah. Um, they had their own. They, they had some really crazy looking tartans actually. They didn't call them tartans, but um, so they're kind of just, they wanted to do something that fit their aesthetic, but they also wanted it to be official so that they could copyright it. And so you just have that stamp of official, yeah. officialdom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but, there were, you had a, it doesn't, it, sometimes it backfires though. Like you had a story about L.L. Bean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. L.L. Bean is actually, um, uh, you know, huge brand in the U.S. They are, they're based in Maine and they're, I would say they are reasonable stewards of culture. They mm -hmm. offer, you know, tartan shirts, um, not kilts, obviously, but they are offering tartan shirts. And the one thing that I'll give them is they'll use real tartans um, in their shirts and okay. they will, you know, a tartan is basically just a pattern. And the name that you give it in Scotland is the clan name. Usually. Um, yeah. So instead of doing the typical big box retailer thing and just saying, you know, they'll have a Gordon modern pattern and say blue and black with yellow stripe check this many dollars, this size, whatever. Um, they would actually call it the Anderson modern tartan or the Gordon modern okay. tartan. So I think that's really cool from their aspect. They're yeah. at least being stewards of the culture and letting you know the name of the tartan that you're wearing. Mm -hmm. Now where that got them in trouble was they used the main M A I N E the state the main state tartan in one of their shirts. And they didn't know that the person who registered it actually copyrighted it. So Oops. they, they got sued Oops. for actually, you know, selling the main state tartan in shirt form. And okay. I don't know. I know that they either lost or settled or something. Um, it wasn't a good outcome for them, but I'm sure that probably taught them a lesson in the, Hmm, some of these are copyrighted. Maybe we better uh, do a little bit yeah, more due diligence deeper, before yeah. Uh, yeah. we jump into that. Now, speaking of that, yeah, we'll we'll move on now to Scottish companies because mm -hmm. Scottish companies, Americans, and you know, out with Scotland and countries out with Scotland, are not alone in you know using Scottish culture as a marketing yeah. tool. Yeah. So companies in Scotland do it as well, and they tend to lean into it a little bit more. And in some ways, they're just as sticky as Americans or other companies, other you know countries mm -hmm. and companies in other countries can be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, like Scottish porridge oats is one. Yep. Um, they yep. use a you know a brawny you know shirtless. I think he's shirtless. Scottish guy, car not cartoon, but like a drawing. Yeah, like a marketing drawing guy. Yeah, yeah marketing drawing like, guy. He's like going up a mountainside or something, or he's got yeah. like a, he's got like a pack, or he's got like a bag of oats. I think it's like he's got yeah. like the thing of oats on his shoulder. Yeah. The classic Highland, highland you know, like a gilly, basically like, you know, I'm I'm the tough gilly. Aha, you know, and if you eat these oats, you're gonna be strong like me. And they're kind of you know Yeah. They kinda, lean into that. Yeah. Um yeah. Walker Shortbread, there's a uh a, a common saying, nomenclature, whatever it is. Um like you look like you're on the shortbread tin. Um it's you look like <laughs> really? the guy the guy on the shortbread I've never tin. Heard yeah. That, that okay. means you're okay. dressing traditionally Perfectly. almost to the point of caricature kind of, of tradition almost. yeah okay. um that's but funny. they're you know again that's something a scottish company that leans into it heavily um then there's the sticky other end of it um the kilted yoga guys um the kilted coaches which are two different you know people um yep. they're you know hey i have an idea let's do handstands in our kilts so we can show off our bums like it's <laughs> it's it's shtick but we know about them because of it you mm -hmm. probably know about them because of it. Yeah, it's social media there. But yeah, so. I think. But that, again, that's purely the sex appeal. Yeah, I think that the Scots will. They go, are sexy. Yeah, they'll go. They'll go either direction with it. You know, they'll they'll tap into all of those different factors we were talking about. Um, I mean, Walkers. <clears throat> um, they're one of their most popular motifs in the last several years is that they actually have uh, this famous painting of uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie. Uh, kissing the hand of Flora McDonald is supposed to be on the, you know, when he's parting from her after she saved his life and rescued him. And that's on all their marketing now. And they took it so far that they actually bought the original painting. <laughs> they own the painting. That's so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, they really are bringing that, that hugely romanticized image because yeah. trust me, if you haven't seen the painting, go look at Walker's tin artwork and you'll see it. They never looked like that. 
when it happened, you know, if he actually did kiss her hand, they weren't dressed like that. I guarantee you. <laughs> um, you know, and, but it's this romantic vision of Highland history and Highland culture and Highland lore. And they're in it, you know, up to their necks and they, but the, you know, they own the painting. I don't know if they've tried to copyright or control usage of the painting. I hope not, but you know, they, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they realize that there is a cachet to Scottishness and to Scottish lore. Yeah. So, um, I'd say that's a classier example in some ways. Now there are some unclassy examples too. Yes. Um, yeah. The uh, give me some unclassy examples. Well, my favorite has to be um, a, not so much a big company, but a small company, uh, as in an individual, is the uh, the Mel Gibson style William Wallace impersonators on the Royal Mile, and they're they're cashing okay. in on Scottishness, but they're not okay. even cashing in on actual historical accurate. Or yeah. accurate. They're, they're cashing in on the fantasy, which is one of those factors is the, the fantasy of the Highlands and of Scotland. And, you know, they don't, doesn't matter if Mel Gibson's portrayal was historically accurate or not. The point is it's the one that everybody recognized. It's the <clears> one that the tourists want to see and have their picture taken with. So that's where they're going to be able to make a livelihood. Now I would, I'd extend that to the entire Royal mile. Um, the okay. tartan tat shops on the Royal mile True. where, True. Where is the line with responsibility for a business or an actor or a, or a performer, if you will, um, of where's the line of uh, what they should be responsible for? Are they responsible for educating tourists in Scotland? If you walk into any shop up and down the Royal Mile, you will see kilts for, you know, 20 quid or, you know, 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. Um those aren't well. They're they're real kilts in that they're pleated, but they're not like, <laughs> traditional kilts. That's a low bar, right? Um, well, the but they're not traditional kilts, right? Um, they right. or you'll see right. Jimmy hats, and you'll see all kinds of things mm -hmm. that are strictly you know tourist trap, you know, junk, not Scottish made, um, yeah. just to sell to tourists and to take advantage of people who really don't know and don't understand and haven't done any research. Does the uh, does the onus lie with the business at all? Does it rely? Does it lie only with the individual to know what they're doing, what they're getting into? Caveat emptor, you know, buyer beware. Yeah. Um, or does the business have some part to play in cheapening their own culture? Are they cheapening it, or are they preserving it in an offhand way because they are providing a livelihood for people who live there? The I lens. Mean, there's, you know, the I mean? lens of the lens of time. <laughs> That's going to be a new, a new phrase. The lens of time um, will will prove that out one way or the other. Yeah. If yeah. fifty years from now, everyone in the entire you know world of Scottish descent, including Scotland, is wearing twenty dollar kilts, then okay. is that good or is that bad? I could, I could, I could see. Um, and this is I'm playing devil's advocate here Understood. because my personal opinion is probably like yours, but um, you could possibly How do argue you know my opinion because I've worked with you for eight years. <laughs> um, the um, I think it's been eight years. Um, blah, blah. So you could you could argue. Gotcha. <laughs> Is that a bad um, thing? <laughs> yes. No. Um, you could never. You could make a, a devil's argument that um, they're providing a taste of the lore that gets people psyched. You know, a taste of the culture that people can afford and, and take home with them. Ramp them up. And it's a, like a gateway drug. Then the people who are really motivated. That's going to be that little, you know, touchstone thing for them. It's like, oh, this is, I loved it. I loved my trip to Edinburgh and I remember it. You know, I really want to learn more. I don't want, I want to, I want to know more about this. I want to do this more. Um, and so they might be providing a kind of a service there. Okay. Other, an, an entryway, a gateway drug. Flip side of that same coin. Mm -hmm. You get a kilt over in Scotland on the Royal Mile and get home and realize it's not your family tartan. And they told you it was, or yeah. you get yeah. a, you know, you get something that's much cheaper than you, th like quality wise mm -hmm. than you thought it was mm -hmm. and it falls apart and then you're disenfranchised or your mom gets yeah. you a kilt and says, Hey honey, I bought a kilt for you on the Royal Mile and you get it. And you're just like, and if that guy knows what he's talking about, this isn't a, this isn't a good kilt mom. This isn't McPherson. This is Stuart. Yeah. They told they sold you the wrong thing. Yeah. Then the mom feels disenfranchised. The mom feels like deflated. Um, but or I, blame, I would take an advantage of. I would blame the company then, not the culture. If anything, that could still work towards what I'm saying that they're going to be. Well, you know, this one was crap. I want a real one now. 
I, it could. This, I, this was a mistake, obviously. I, you know. Yeah, it could, or they could just be like even more deflated at either the the price or the experience, or I can't believe that dude did that to me. Mm-hmm. You know, ugh, mm-hmm. they must all be like that. It's I'm taking it obviously to an extreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, but we're, we're just kind of playing, example. you know, extreme devil's advocates. Right, right. So I I agree, and we've actually done the same thing. We, we've said the same thing. Um, to our casual kill, like you know, it's it's a gateway drug. You know, we're the candy man. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's it, it yeah. does get people into it. That's how yeah. I started. I well, didn't yeah. want to buy a five hundred dollar kill. Right. I bought an eighty dollar. I one. think, and 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 my personal opinion is that that um, your finances should not have to be a barrier to you getting into your True. root culture and exploring your heritage. And if and if we can provide something that allows people to express themselves, um, you know, that's a fair price. Then I think that's okay. Um, but there's that's a as base, long as that's you're honest and as long as you're honest the about the quality, the country of origin, about what it is. And you're not trying to say, yeah, you know, this this kilt right here is McDonald. Sure, Mr. McDonald, right. here you go. Right, right. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> um, you got to come up with some kind of evil. I'm going to sample that. Yes. I'm going to sample that. But... Um, so it's as long as the 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 company itself is being honest and honorable in what they're doing. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier is I think, and and this is a bit more opinionated than I necessarily want to be, but I think that we're more on that end of the spectrum where the honesty part is part and parcel of being a sincere student of the culture and respecting Mm -hmm. the culture. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, not really caring and just using it as a pastiche, as a special effect, if you will, goes in hand in hand a lot of the time, maybe not all the time, certainly not all the time, but part of the time with being dishonest. So there's, there's something there. There's, yeah. there's an ethical thing. Now I'll, I'll take it in a slightly different direction to keep moving here. Before you, if I won't lose your thought, I want to see if we have any other input from, sure. from folks. Is there anybody wanted to say anything or have any questions? <clears throat> there's a few people talking uh, okay. back and forth. Uh, if they're talking back and forth, that's great. Cause that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It, start conversations. Yeah. It's, a lot of people are comparing what we're saying or what you guys are saying to uh, like Italian wear or Chinese wear. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's a lot of those, a lot of that end of the spectrum. You probably argue that any traditional culture runs into this as a challenge. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, there's also some, some thought of just being the businesses on the Royal Mile being more, more of an issue with fraud than as far as saying yeah, what it is or too. what it isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. than it actually being. Oh, there's, there, there are, <laughs> the Royal Mile is its own quandary to unpack in itself. Um, there's, there's a lot of things going on there, uh, positive, negative, and otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But that kind of, to the broader point that I'll, I'll pose this question. Okay. Um, companies that are outside of Scotland are, that are, that are making our living off of Scottish culture. Yeah. Are we hypocrites? Are we, I uh, and I think with that kind of, you know, we are not Scottish. We weren't born in Scotland. My grandparents weren't born in Scotland. Right. We are Americans. Um, when I started in this, I just really, really dug all of it. And I was a sincere student of kilts and the entire thing. Uh-huh. Um, Eric came in more from a history angle and from a, he just loved kilts angle as yeah. well. I had a heritage ang- angle in there also, but it was low key for me at the time. Yeah. It was okay. not as important to me as it is now. Yeah. So. so that's the question that I would pose then is, are we hypocrites for selling Scottish goods and we're not in Scotland? Or at least, you know, are, is a company, um, I'll take us out of it a little bit, is a company that sells Scottish made goods outside of Scotland that's promoting that culture hypocritical or a company that sells, you know, Pakistani, Chinese made Scottish goods outside of Scotland. Are they, where do they fall in the spectrum? Um, Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's an entire spectrum of how honest and forthright and, you know, transparent and all these things. Yeah. You are with it. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on what your goal is also. I mean, you could, we could, you could, you could basically say, uh, a little bit like how um, Utilikilt said originally was that, you know, we recognize the technological advantages of a kilt. Yeah, it's Scottish, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to provide a man skirt that people will enjoy wearing and get functional use out of. 
And uh, and that's how they basically shut down the argument of, well, you shouldn't do this because it's not Scottish, it's not a proper kilt. At the same time, the ultra traditionalist angle would be to say, no, you guys are you guys are just kind of you're making money off of our culture. You know what 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 right do you have to do that? You know I don't I don't think I obviously don't feel that way. Otherwise I wouldn't be working here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, fair. Um, it's uh, that that's those are the two sides of it. I would say. You know who else has that problem is um, uh, Irish pubs. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of Irish pubs start off as either you know a college bar with Irish decorations, or on one end of the spectrum, or a an earnest Irish pub, mm -hmm. and then. Mm -hmm. Over time, they realize that they can't do the earnest Irish pub thing every single day. Yeah. And there's not as much call for it maybe as they thought. And then they kind of slide right. down from, you know, Irish music live every night of the week to, okay, once a week to, okay, sessions on Sundays, but, you know, college bands on right. Friday and Saturday. Right. Um, Unless it's football season, in which case, forget. Yes. But, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, but they're, they're having to survive as a business yeah, and they're having to deal with the public that's, that's in front of them. So um, sometimes your personal dream as a marketer or a business person or whatever may have to get a little <coughs> co-opted in order for your business to survive. Maybe, yeah, you know, well, like, like the guy who started that pub may have wanted a little piece of Dublin in his hometown. Um, but he also needs to eat. Yeah. You know, it could be, I mean, we've, we have thankfully been able to run this business for years now with uh, a very clear definition of how we're going to source things. Yep. But I'm sure there are other people out there who would like to sell kilts that they make and they really care about the heritage, but their business model or the market they're dealing with means that they have to import stuff from Asia or something, you know? So there's, there's choices that you have to make as the receiver of the cultural product and also choices you have to make as the purveyor, pur purveyor the provider. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, compl to it's complicated. Uh, back to your other thing, the um, uh, about about us and you know if so, how would someone in Scotland would feel about us doing what we do? Yeah. Um, the I'll, I'll get I'll get defensive for half a second. Um, <laughs> okay. The uh, and go. <laughs> the uh, uh, what we're trying to do through videos like this and through our Q and A videos is really a be students of the culture mm -hmm. and b teach people the traditional way to do things or not necessarily what is right or what is wrong, but give our opinions on it and keep it kind of respectful and based in the culture. That's the point. That's why we call yeah. the show kilts and culture. Right. It's not, you know, Rocky and Eric's happy fun time. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a totally different it could show. be. Yes. Yeah. Um, All but, the bar. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. True. So, True. and there aren't, there aren't a, bunch of people doing what we're doing. Uh -huh. And that's kind of the point uh -huh. is that, you know, we're, we are trying to push it forward and to keep it for posterity and yep. to, you know, do good. When one, yeah. when one for the Gipper. Exactly. When, when one for the Wallace, I think, um, I would say, I would say I can have a lot of sympathy for a lot of companies in Scotland along these lines too, that, um, that street performer in Edinburgh, um, he's trying to make a living. Yeah, he may be know? an actor. Yeah, an out of work actor, just yeah. trying to right do something. You know, it's a, a, the opposite end of the spectrum. It was a good example. Is Christopher Tate? He's an, he's a highly accomplished oh, the, actor. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. The, you know, does does the burn the stuff. burns guy? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he's he's really trying to do as accurate as possible a representation of Robert Burns himself, as well as his art and the culture that surrounded it. Right. You know, so it's going to appeal to different audiences. Right. I mean, I guess maybe the trick is to realize that, um, like I say about content and jokes and stuff, is like don't try to come up with something that everybody's going to get. Just have faith that the right people will get it. You know, you guys. Yeah. Um, you know, like if you're Disney and you're putting out a movie like Brave, that's much more of a lowest common denominator thing. Agreed. I would argue. Yes. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Whereas you have to have mass appeal. Right. Um, whereas um, you, d if you're not if you don't have the kind of overhead of being a big corporation, having to make lots of money off of your product, um, then you can be more selective and you can be more nuanced. Maybe you could also add little jokes into, or things into a movie like that. Like if they were, uh, if they did a little joke about, you know, Campbell's not liking McDonald's or something, the right people would get it. Yeah. People who were just, you know, you know, don't understand anything about the culture would, it would go right yeah. over their heads, but yeah. the right people would hit it. Yeah. It would hit on it. Yeah. Suppose yeah. It. Yeah. It's true. Now, 
how speaking of Hollywood and stuff, what about let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum okay. or similar end of the spectrum to Hollywood in some regards, um, like Halloween costumes. Oh, geez. Um, Obviously just blew my hand there. You know, uh, <laughs> I just showed you my showed you my cards. Um, I don't have a lot of respect for uh, Scottish themed Halloween costumes. I don't have a lot of respect for most Halloween costumes, actually. But uh, yeah, um, I would generally consider that to be on the tacky, slimy, appropriative end of the spectrum. Caricature. The caricatures, yeah. yes. Um, and of course, there's the sex appeal aspect too. It's like, oh, you know, sexy Highland lass, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the there's the worst example is there's a, uh, a Scotsman Halloween costume out there where there's a fake sporn patch of fur on, on the thing and it has printed on, you know, what's under the kilt. And if you lift the kilt, there is a fake polyfoam member which can drop down that's like three feet long. So you get that, wah, wah, uh, ha ha, it's the joke, you know. Uh, um, it's kind of hard. Classy. I think we're in safe territory saying that that's tacky. Yeah. I don't think I have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows. Like, uh -huh. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, the other example that we always come up with with that kind of thing is Jimmy hats, right? Mm -hmm. But there are Scotch people who love Jimmy hats. Yeah. They wear them at soccer matches, or, sorry, football matches. You know, and I actually have a photo in my archive of these uh, these girls who are bagpipers, like student bagpipers, yep, yep. marching in a parade in like Glasgow or something, and they're wearing Jimmy hats as a lark, just as a lark. Um, so yeah, it's kind of some now, people will decide to own the tackiness. And is that is are are the girls in that scenario as bad as a somebody dressing up for Halloween in a Jimmy hat? Like it's literally the same thing, just in a different context. People, Does context trump it there? Because it's it's just a wee bit of fun. Or is it, no, that's horrible too. I think it's going to come down to different people have to come up with their personal perspective as to whether um, it's appropriate or right. I mean, you could easily make an argument that if you're not Scottish, um, then then you you don't really have a right to make fun of Scottish culture. Right. I mean, um, or if you are Scottish, you kind of can, you know, like African American culture will use the N word in among themselves sometimes. Fair. Um, because they've they've co opted it and brought it into their own. Jimmy hats maybe are kind of the same. In spectrum. the same vein. In Got the it. same vein. Yeah. 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 yeah Songs like okay. that. But uh, yeah. Do you, do you want to explain what a Jimmy hat is? That oh, seems sorry. to be a big sorry. question going um, on. Do a quick Google image search on it. It's basically it's a tartan tam like Tam. hat. With the pom pom on it, um, and a fake bright orange wig attached. So it's basically like instant Scotsman. Just put the hat on, and you got the hair, and you can go insta ginger. <laughs> yeah, insta ginger. Yeah. Well, well, you might not want to Google it because apparently it's coming up with uh, other rubber objects. Oh, well. condoms. <laughs> Whoops. Don't Google Jimmy hat. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet that the one led to the other. Yes. Look for Scottish Jimmy hat, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Now I don't want to suggest anything to Google search. I love this. Uh, it just broke the internet. Uh, uh, um, I'd be willing to bet that the, for the slang for the first for the condom came first, and then people who disrespected the Jimmy hat because Jimmy's not a Scottish name, right? Yeah. But um, everybody calls it a Jimmy hat, right? Oh, uh, that's what it's called. Yeah. Why wouldn't you call it an Angus hat? Oh. You know. So I. Maybe Jimmy invented it. I, <laughs> Jimmy invented a lot of things, apparently. Yes. 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 <laughs> Jimmy had a good and, time. And wore a lot of hats. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, yes. yes. So I digress. Anything else we want to? Uh, we're about the uh, the hour mark, guys. We were actually planning on doing this for about a half hour, but as Eric is so long winded, I am very brief. But he no. Um, <laughs> the uh, we're going to wrap it up in a couple minutes. Is there any other final points or any questions from the audience there, Mac? No, just uh, maybe tartan condoms. Maybe is what we want to get into next. <laughs> What end of the spectrum is that on? <laughs> you think the lower end? <laughs> um, but all right. I have, I had as I was being really high minded and intellectual with the show, and just no, oh, no, no. Like, yeah, it's us. I, <laughs> we I, get to be high minded for anything. You, you know what? I think that I think, but I that may lead into what I think is my final statement on all this. Um, is that if you are secure in your cultural identity, if you're secure in your heritage and you know who and what you are in that in a social context like that 
then a little good natured <clears throat> ribbing maybe doesn't bother you. Whereas if you're insecure or if you feel that you're under threat, it does bother you. So like the, the girls in the pipe band in Glasgow or wherever that photo's from with the Jimmy hats, it's a quick lark because they are up to their eyeballs in their heritage and they feel totally secure about it. Okay. Whereas, whereas if somebody who is, you know, part of the old guard, you know, like maybe has a uh, noble ancestry, say in Scott, you know, like they're, they're, you know, they're, they're a direct descendant of a Lord. Um, and they feel like the culture is under threat. They may see all of it as a cheapening and a pastiche and a danger to the sanctity and of preservation and of the preservation yeah. of Highland culture. I would, I would agree to a large portion okay. and disagree with the insecurity bit. I don't think that's fully encompasses what it is. Okay. Um, to your, to your other point earlier, it's kind of like the, Hey, no one makes fun of my brother, but me kind of mentality yeah. Yeah. where yeah. if I am that and it's my brother, you know, I can make fun of him, but you can't, you're not in my family. You're not one of us. Yeah. So if maybe from out with Scotland, it would be a little out with meaning outside of Scotland. Okay. The it would be a little bit more. Uh, you'd be a little bit more defensive of your own culture. Um, that yeah. doesn't account for the people in Scotland who, you know, are willy nilly about it and do throw on the Jimmy hat. Um, sure. But yeah, you know, ultimately, there when we're talking about stereotypes and stuff like that, this there's always a grain of truth to any stereotype. That's why it's a stereotype. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a reasonably high percentage worldwide of Scots who have red hair versus black hair or something like that and, compared and to tempers. the rest of the world. Yeah, and some, you know, of, them, some of them are actually feisty. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Irish maybe fight a little bit more or maybe drink a little bit more or whatever. Right. There may be truth to certain aspects of it, which is part of the stereotypes. Uh, yeah. But I think you, I think you touched on that too, this yeah, a good point there is that it may be the people in the diaspora are going to be more defensive because they feel like they're more, you know, at sea, as it were, as opposed to people in the home country yeah. who are surrounded by it daily um, will not be as defensive. Yeah. You know, Agreed. interesting. Okay. So it's a lot to think about. Yeah. So boys and girls, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. We are going to have to sign off now because we promised we were going to keep it under an hour. Now, we are going to try to do these kind of things um, once a month or so in the off weeks where we don't do our other broadcasts. Right. So, again, these are – well, we were supposed to have less of an opinion in these. I don't know if we accomplished <laughs> that at all. I think we did okay. I think we, I think <laughs> um, we did all right. But we, we're just trying to – as I said before, we're just trying to explore the arguments from different sides and just kind of unpack different topics. So if you have any particular topics – Celtic in nature, obviously. We don't want to right. go into politics or religion or anything like that. Right. But if you have any topics, Celtic in nature, that you want us to kind of unpack, please drop us an email, sales at usakilts.com, and we'd be happy to look at that. But mm -hmm. any other? I'm just going to say that uh, just bear in mind that not every episode of this series is going to be contentious as a topic. There's going to be lighter weight stuff that we talk about, too. Um, there's lots of ideas, lots of concepts in Celtic culture to unpack. They're yeah. not always going to be as, you know, uh, weighty. as weighty as this one. Yeah. So, but yeah, but absolutely. Bring us the ideas. Very good. All right, boys and girls. Until next time. It's Langevin.